focus this morning on the first 14 verses of Romans chapter 8. Without commenting on uh, the current health care plan in America, which I suppose we have many varying opinions in this room, just state this much about it, that it offers a period of open enrollment. For a certain period of time, you have the option to select whatever coverage you want, whatever plan within that that works best for you. Now, I'm thinking about a far more important plan than the government health care plan, namely that God offers to us the most important plan of all, and we can opt into his plan during an open enrollment period. And I think it's important to punctuate it that way. God has a plan that has a specific enrollment period because it won't last forever. You've got to choose while there's an opportunity to choose, kind of like the, the health care system. And now's the time to make that choice. And I think that as most of us, at least in this room, who have made the right choice for his plan, we wonder why everybody doesn't opt in to, shall we say, the greatest health care plan of all. People who will study carefully all the details of a health care plan say, I, I, I got to do my homework on this, and now this is what I will select. People that will do that that don't give much of a thought to this most important plan that God has, and we scratch our heads and say, why not? Something so important as a plan that God offers, why don't people give more deliberate thought to that? And you know as well as I do that a lot of people live their lives in hope that their good enough lives are going to get them into the kingdom of God. That sense that God will grade on the curve. You know, believe me, I haven't been such a bad person, God, that when the time comes and I stand before you, surely you're going to let me in because I have been such a bad person. I would wonder why anybody would gamble on anything that important when the issue can very clearly and easily be settled. And the case in point is the very first verse of Romans chapter 8. And I absolutely love the assurance of this verse. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So gambling that God is going to say, My life is good enough to let me into the kingdom of God, that's way too iffy for me. And it should be for, for any and every person. Because here the issue can be settled. If I am in Christ... If I have made a decision to accept the plan, to opt into the plan of God, if I am in Christ, I have the tremendous assurance, you have the tremendous assurance, there is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a wonderful hope? Amen? Amen. Amen. If you opt in to God's plan, as we look in the verses that follow verse 1 here in chapter 8, there are basically two great benefits that we receive when we come to Christ and we are born again. The first one is pardon, which we've just talked about in verse 1. Pardon and secondly, power. And so here are two great benefits of the plan that God offers to every single human being. Pardon and power. Now you think about pardon, and that may not seem all that pressing and maybe not all that important right now. But suppose that each of us were standing before a judge right now accused of a particular crime, I would think that pardon would be front and center, wouldn't it? If I'm standing before a judge right now and I've been accused of a crime, the thing that I desperately want is mercy and grace. I want my, my crime to be overlooked, done away with. And so pardon would mean something very, very much to me if that were my situation. Last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 says this. John the Apostle in a vision says he saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, the throne of God, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. I don't know how all that works out. I haven't seen God's books. 
but I would be trembling in my, my shoes if I have to stand before God and give account of my life based on how good I've been or how good I've tried to be. I want my name in the book of life, and my name is in the book of life, according to verse 1, if I have given my life to Jesus Christ. Fact of the matter is, everybody is going to give an account of their lives someday. No exceptions. Every single person who has ever lived all throughout the ages, every single individual will one day stand before the throne of God and give an account. And I am sure glad that I can give an account of my life because it is in Christ. I stand on His credentials. In Christ we stand on His credentials, not on the merit of how good of a life we have tried to live. And that is certainly a much, much better position to be in. Verses 5 to 8, jumping ahead here in this passage, Paul says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. And the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Two fundamental choices in how it is that we live our lives. We have the option to live our life according to the flesh, according to these words. And that is absolutely the easiest choice of all. Many people every day are making that easy choice. Because to live your life according to the flesh, really the only thing, the only criteria is whatever your mind and body tells you to do, that's what you do. Kind of like that old saying in the 60s and 70s, if it feels good, do it. And that's basically the mindset of the flesh. Whatever I want to do, then that's what I will do. Whatever pleasure I seek, that's what I seek. And so that's the, the lifestyle of living according to the flesh. But it would be good if every single human being could know this that Paul has just said in these verses. If you choose that lifestyle, he said the mindset on the flesh is death. The ultimate result of seeking pleasure, seeking self, doing what I want to do. Paul says it is death. He says the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. It is at war against God. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Again, a point important to drive home by those who would try to rationalize and say, well, God, I've never really been a bad person. You know, I haven't committed the, the big sins. I haven't committed murder or adultery. I've generally been a, a pretty good neighbor to my neighbors. I've been pretty good to my co-workers and to my family. Surely, God, you will grade me on the curve because that's how I have lived my life. Again, that is the life of living according to the flesh. And Paul is very, very clear concerning it. To live that way, no matter how good or bad within that lifestyle, it is a death lifestyle. It is a lifestyle in hostility toward God. And it is an absolute impossibility to please Him because we simply cannot try hard enough. You know the truth of Romans 3.23. All have sinned. And falls short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, as Paul has said here in this chapter. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that first option for lifestyle doesn't sound like a very good one. So living the life of the Spirit makes a lot more sense. Because he says those who are according to the Spirit, those who have set their minds on the Spirit, these are the things of the Spirit, and the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. I like that offer. I like the idea of life. Abundant life now and life in the age to come. I like that. So the mindset of the Spirit is that of life, and it is that of peace. Those who seek to live a flesh lifestyle, as Paul described here, rarely have peace. Constantly searching for pleasures and things that will be fulfilling that never come into people's lives no matter how hard they try. And so that is certainly an exercise in futility. But again, the mindset on the spirit infuses life into this mortal body and it is a lifestyle of peace. 
And so when you look at the two choices as Paul has laid them out here today, the lifestyle and the mindset ought to be obvious, and I know which one I prefer. I want to live the life of the Spirit. Verse 9, Paul says, however, you are not in the flesh, those of us who've come to Christ, those of us who have no condemnation, verse 1, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Focusing on that verse, there is one monumentally important if in that verse. And it's so important that we need to linger on it for just a little bit, make sure we catch the drift of what Paul is trying to say. That if the Spirit of God dwells in you, if the Spirit of God dwells within it, he reverses it in a negative sense, the last part of that verse, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. And so all of this comes down to us if we have the Spirit of God. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If I'm in Christ Jesus, I have the Spirit of God. If I don't have that Spirit, I don't belong to Christ. And so that is something very, very important that I would have the Spirit of God in my life. It's called the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ in these verses. And I just want to state that they are one and the same. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. It is the Spirit that originates from God our Father, our Creator Yahweh, but it is the Spirit wherein Jesus Christ literally dwells within. And I may spend all of my life following Christ and never fully understanding how that works, but Christ is present in every person's life, who's given their life to him, through that Spirit. And so He's present to every one of us here right now at the same time and same moment. Every single individual who belongs to God through Christ has that inhabiting spirit within. And what a blessing and a privilege. And whether we understand it or not, we sure can appreciate it. Jesus said in John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 17 and 18. He said, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth. There's another descriptive phrase. It is the spirit of God, spirit of Christ, spirit of truth. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And so thus it is the spirit of Christ. He said, I will ask the Father to take of his dynamic power, that power that made the world and everything that exists. I will ask the Father to give of his spirit to be in your life. and In fact, I will not leave you as orphans, he says to his original disciples. I'm about to leave the earthly scene to go to the right hand of my Father, but I'm not going to leave you alone as orphans. I literally am going to come and dwell in your life, uh, perhaps even more so than they had experience of him during the earthly ministry. And so he dwells in our lives through that dynamic spirit. The whole issue here that is so important, everything rises and falls on whether or not we have the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ within our lives. Without that Spirit, as Paul has said, I am living a death lifestyle. I am openly hostile toward God and I absolutely no way can begin to please God. I have got to have that Spirit within. And those who do not have that Spirit, those who are devoid of that Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ, will most assuredly face harsh judgment and destruction one day before the throne of God. But those who have it, and I pray that every one of us in this room do, those who have it have the power and the potential to live as God and Christ want. And that is so very, very important. So nothing could be more important than the issue of whether or not we have, I have, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ within. And so it's a pretty simple question and issue to settle. Do I have it or don't I? And I wonder if I walked around this room and walked up to every one of you as an individual and said, do you have the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ within? I would hope that you could quickly and confidently say, yes, I do. Yes, I do. But I suspect some of us may have some doubts. I think I have it, but I'm not entirely sure. I think I have the Spirit of God within, but I'm not entirely sure. There are some confusing messages out there in Christianity that might give us a little bit of doubt sometimes. 
And I think it's important to be very, very clear on these things in terms of having the Spirit of Christ and the Spirit of God within. There are some that would tell us that the absolute evidence I have the Spirit of God in Christ is I speak in unknown languages and tongues. And some would insist that is the only sure way to know that you have the Spirit of God. Others would say, if you have the Spirit of God, you will touch sick people and they'll be healed. That's absolute proof, according to what some people would say. The absolute proof that you have the Spirit of God is that you have been born again and you've given your life to Christ. Acts 2.38, which we lift up often, is the one verse that I believe ought to quickly settle the issue. The Apostle Peter declaring the first message in the brand new church when, when the people had heard that and they were deeply moved, they were cut to the heart it says, and they wanted to know what do we do in response to what we have just heard. His answer is very, very important. He says repent, which means to change our minds, our hearts, the direction of our lives. Repent, he says, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the purpose that your sins be forgiven. And the last part is what ought to settle the issue and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so those other things we talked about may be manifested. Certainly God can do whatever He wants with the Spirit in our lives. But you can know without a doubt that if you have come to Christ, if you've repented of the direction you've been going, if you have been baptized in water, if you've been immersed in water for the purpose of the forgiveness of your sins, you can be assured you have that Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ that Paul talks about in this chapter. You have that in your life. And so it can be settled that if you've done that, if you met that if condition, that indeed you have that spirit within your life. And so verse 11 becomes a promise. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells within there's a lot to grasp in that verse. If I've given my life to Christ, if I've been born again, if I then have received the Spirit of God, it is the same Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead that we celebrate especially at Easter season. I have that same Spirit within, and that same Spirit as assuredly as it raised Jesus as a dead person out of the grave, it will give life to this mortal body right now. And can you begin to imagine the possibilities? If that same spirit is within, what could it do in my life today? What kinds of things could happen in my life if that spirit dwells within? Think about the possibilities. Pray about the possibilities and celebrate those possibilities because you have that spirit in your life. Look at verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. I might say sons and daughters of God. All who are being led by that Spirit truly are the children of God. We have it within us and the key thing is that we need to be in step with that internal Spirit. I would love to stand before you today and tell you that the Christian life is like flying an airplane on autopilot or like driving your car on cruise control. We still face choices. We still choose which, which nature we want to follow. I still have a choice if I want to live a fleshly lifestyle described here or if I want to live the spirit lifestyle. I still have to make that choice. And so I, I have to determine daily that I will follow the spirit. I guess it's kind of like that little cartoon, you know, with the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. And we all face those choices. I've got to decide which one I'm going to listen to. We still have the choice. But we have phenomenal potential in listening to the Spirit, in staying in step with the Spirit, to allowing God to do some amazing things in our lives. I love these great truths that Paul has outlined here in Romans chapter 8. In particular, living the life of the Spirit. And just in my experience when I was growing up, I didn't hear a lot about living the life of the Spirit. In fairness, it may not be that they weren't teaching it. It might be that I wasn't listening well. But nevertheless, I didn't remember letting a lot soak into my life about living the life of the Spirit. What I heard about were the do's and the don'ts. Good Christian people do not do these things, and good Christian people do these things. And so I was very familiar with the lists, but I had no idea how to really work with those lists. 
I found myself like Paul. The things that I, I want to do, that I tried to do, well, I, I wound up on the other side doing exactly the, the don't list. And so what a dilemma. And I often found out how very, very difficult that was. I beat my head up against the wall and I failed many, many times. But I've learned, and I especially learn out of the chapter we've looked at here today, that the way is summed up very, very simply. Don't try harder, yield more. Because I think that's the secret of the Christian life. Don't try harder, yield to the internal spirit more. Kind of to use the example of magnets. You know what it's like if you take two magnets of the same polarity. And you try pushing them together and the closer they get, the more they resist. And that's kind of like living this life in the flesh where I try to please God. And it's exactly as Paul has outlined. There's, there's hostility. There's a, a repulsion to the things of God. No matter how hard I try, it doesn't work. I can never quite get to that point where I'm pleasing God. The life of the Spirit is really like flipping the opposite sides of the magnet where they're naturally attracted to one another. After all, the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ within is a part of God in Christ. It makes sense that what we have within would be drawn back to the source, to them. And, and so to stay in step with the Spirit is to follow that flow that is drawing me to God and to Christ and their nature. And things just work a lot better that way. And those are the kinds of things that I believe that Paul is outlining for us here. We nurture the life of the Spirit within. That's why we talk about Bible study and prayer. Because it's kind of like a seed in the garden. We want it to grow. And the way that it grows is by disciplining ourselves with those things conducive to the nature of God and Christ. Namely, God's Word, what it reveals about Him so I can know Him better and know His Son better. And the practice of prayer that puts me in communication with God and with Christ. And so it just makes a lot more sense to live our lives this way, the life of the Spirit, instead of trying to live the life of the flesh. I think the best takeaways that we have from our studies out of God's Word are not the points that I try to make, but the applications you make. And so along those lines, I want to give you some questions this morning. Don't answer them out loud, but think about them. And consider them more than just this morning, perhaps in the days ahead. But I've outlined, I believe, about five questions I want to just leave you with in response to this text this morning. Number one, how real is the truth to me that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus? You may read that but not really believe it. How can that truth become more real to you? Secondly, honestly, am I more yielding to the inner work of Holy Spirit or to my natural human side? It doesn't do you any good to not be honest with that. God knows. And if you're honestly able to say, I yield more to the flesh than to the Spirit, then God, let's have a talk. Because I want it the other way around. How can this be worked out in my life? So it's a good question for each of us to honestly face. Number three, what habits in my life exist as strongholds against the work of Holy Spirit? And how can I gain victory over them? Again, that may require some discussion with God and with Christ. Reveal them to me so we can deal with them. Number four, what positive habits can be developed in my life that will most harmonize with the Spirit's work? What new habits, God, do you want to form in my life that are consistent with the work of the Spirit? And number five, I think this is so important, how could, uh, who can I partner with so that together we can grow more in spirit life? It's a tough battle on your own. That's what church is about, is partnering with one another and being honest with one another. So is there one or more individuals that you can honestly partner with so that you can grow in that way? The work of the Spirit is indeed the renewing of our minds, as we are told in Romans 12 too. So I want to leave you with this one simple challenge because it contains a very important truth. Let the mind of the Master be the master of your mind.